Hello and good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Introduction to the Visa Bulletin. We have a great presentation ahead of us, but before we get there, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items. First, today's session will be 45 minutes long, and that includes an audience Q&A at the end of the main presentation. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and type those in via the GoToWebinar question panel that you should see on your screen. Um, and we'll try to get to them at the end of the main presentation. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded and everyone in attendance will receive a link to download the recording after today's live session. You will also receive a link to download the slide deck as well as the SHRM and HRCI continuing education credits. All of these materials will arrive in your email inboxes tomorrow afternoon, so please keep an eye out on that message. And if uh, you do not receive it, just please let us know and we'll be sure to send it your way. Final housekeeping notes, uh, please excuse any video or audio interruptions that may occur as a result of remote work and internet connections. We are not anticipating anything, but if you are experiencing severe difficulties, we recommend signing out and then signing back in again as that tends to fix most issues. Uh, so moving along, I'd like to talk a little bit about Envoy Global for those that are unfamiliar with us. For nearly 20 years, Envoy has been on a mission to fix the frustrating, inefficient, and confusing immigration process. Envoy combines top tier legal teams with innovative technology to deliver the only platform that makes it seamless for companies to hire, mobilize, and manage a global workforce. Envoy secures work authorization in over 100 countries, has averaged uh, grown 33% over a three year average, uh, and works with over 1,000 customers. We're particularly proud of our NPS score, which is a testament to the employee experience that we provide. Now I'd like to introduce the first of our two panelists today, starting first with Chrissy Umstotter, a founding partner at Corporate Immigration Partners. Christy has been helping foreign nationals since 1997 and practicing business immigration law with prominent law firms since 2001. Over the course of her professional career, Christy gained extensive experience partnering with corporate clients of all sizes, from startups to Fortune 500 companies. Christy is trained and certified by Worldwide ERC as a global mobility specialist, which serves as the base of her keen understanding of a wide range of global mobility issues facing clients. And this holistic approach to her practice addresses immigration's multifaceted nature from relocation resources to cross-cultural considerations. And second, I'd like to introduce Marco Satala, an attorney with Corporate Immigration Partners. Marco has been practicing immigration law since 2014, and prior to that, he worked as a law clerk in business immigration since 2012. His client base spans startups to Fortune 100 companies in the technology, mining, healthcare, biomedical, and gaming industries. With a solutions-oriented approach, Marco enjoys finding creative ways to ensure companies obtain the best possible talent and overcome denied cases. Marco is the son of Polish and Chilean immigrants, which motivated him to help others pursuing their dreams in the U.S. Christy and Marco, thank you so much for uh, joining us on today's presentation. Really looking forward to it. You're very welcome. <laughs> Great, so I have one more introductory slide and that is a short legal disclaimer. So I will leave this up for a few more seconds. And with that, uh, I'm gonna hand it off to you, Christy and Marco, uh, to take it away and just let me know when to advance the slides. Got it, thanks so much, Eric. Um, hello everyone, happy Thursday. I hope everyone's having a great day so far. Um, I know that today's seminar webinar is going to focus on the introduction to the Visa Bulletin. But before we delve into the Visa Bulletin, we really wanted to provide a bit more context to everyone on the call today. Why do we care about the Visa Bulletin? And essentially the reason why we care so much about the Visa Bulletin is because it helps us determine how long it will take for an individual to go through the entire green card process. Green card processing um, varies for in, from individual to individual. Some people pursue permanent residency through marriage, through the family-based route. 
Others pursue permanent residency um, through a program called Diversity Lottery. Most of the clients that we work with go through the green card process through company sponsorship. And so we wanted to talk through the three stages of the green card process, just to highlight the context of the discussions on the bulletin. So Eric, can you fast forward to the next slide? Generally speaking, there are three stages to the green card process. The first stage is called PERP. It stands for Program Electronic Review Management. It's not that hairdo, but it's uh, electronic filing with the Department of Labor. And in essence, when a company files a PERM application, what they're doing is they're testing the labor market, going out there, recruiting, um, not being able to find qualified U.S. workers for particular roles, and therefore the justification to file a PERM application. The day we file a PERM application or the day a company files a PERM application is a really important date. I'll talk about that later on down the road, but just keep in mind that the first stage is a filing with the Department of Labor. These days with government processing times, we're expecting PERM applications to take anywhere from 10 to 12 months, um, but that's just the first process. So once someone overcomes that first hurdle, we then move forward to the second stage of the green card process. The second stage of the green card process is called the immigrant petition. It's also referred to as what we call the I-144. Um, this is the stage where we call it the show me your document stage. Um, this is where we establish the company is a viable company. It has the means of paying the wages of the particular PERM application. And this is where we show that the beneficiary employee has the education, experience, and skills as um, stated in the PERM application. So this is the second stage. And at the second stage of the green card process, these days when we're looking at government processing times with the immigration service, we're looking at six to eight months. Um, there is premium processing, which is an expedite process that allows for companies to get the decision within 15 business days, which is fantastic. So in essence, some individuals would be able to clear the second stage in 15 business days. Um, there is a sub special subset of those who are what we call priority workers. And for those folks, um, there's three, three subcategories under the pre first preference category. Two are allowed to be expedited, expedited, one isn't. But for those individuals, that can take anywhere from 12 to 16 months to process if premium process it isn't allowed. So once an individual clears this second stage, they're finally ready to file the last stage of the green card process, which is the adjustment of status. Um, it's also referred to as the I-485 application. This is the stage where everyone waits for to finally file the green card application. It's at this stage where we now add family members, we add spouses and children. But the reason why we care about the visa bulletin is this. For some people, from stage two to stage three, it's one right after the other. For others, they might have to wait anywhere from two to three years. And even for other individuals, you're looking at a 10 year wait from stage two to stage three. And the reason being is we look at visa processing dates for certain impacted countries. And that's why we care so much about the visa bulletin. So with that as the backdrop of our discussion today, I'm gonna to hand it over to Marco to talk about the Visa Bulletin in and of itself. Thank you, Christy. And so happy to be here with everyone. Uh, we'll try to make this as exciting as possible, although it's a little hard to do so with something like the Visa Bulletin, but we can give it a shot. Uh, so Eric, next slide, please. So who publishes the Visa Bulletin and how frequently? What is the Visa Bulletin? We keep alluding to it. So before I dive into that, I do wanna give a quick civics lesson. The Department of State is in charge of foreign affairs and managing international relations, including consular services. And according to US immigration law, they set an approximate limit of 140,000 visas per year. And there's also an allotment of 20, I'm sorry, I have 226,000. <laughs> sorry, Christy, could you take over this slide? I'm having some audio issues over here. Perfect. So the Department of State is the agency that dictates visa numbers. And so for 
family-based cases, an allotment each year is an annual limit of 100, I wanna, no, it's 226,000 for family-based cases. And for employment-based matters, we're looking at 140,000 per year. The thing to keep in mind with the Department of State is no one country can have more than 7% immigration rates to the US. And within the visa bulletin, there's sort of different categories that we sort of alluded to. And so um, Mark was gonna, I think he's ready and, and can go back to it now, but just wanted to share in terms of um, the dates and the numbers that we look at. So keep in mind also that the government's fiscal year starts October 1st of every year and then ends in September. So when we talk about visa numbers for a particular fiscal year, it always starts October 1st and ends at the end of September. Thanks, Christy. Sorry about that, everyone. Had some mic issues. So basically, with this allotment of available visas, something particular happens where there's only 7% allowed per country for these visas, and that creates a heavy backlog for some countries like India and China, which we'll get to. But who forecasts these numbers? Who's the Wizard of Oz behind this? And there's someone interesting called Charlie Oppenheim. He acts like a project manager. He starts with the annual limit every year and he works through it like a budget. He breaks down the annual allocation into quarterly targets. And as the year progresses, he en encounters several factors that he uses for it. Some of these visa numbers are set aside for emergencies. Some are used for consular returns, but basically he is the person who dictates how many visas are used every year. So, with that, next slide. And one more. So something to break down is that there are two charts per category. There's a family sponsored and an employment sponsored. So each one determines green card availability. Uh, something to keep in mind, each chart has five preferences and uh, there are employment based ones like EB1, EB2, EB3 down to EB4, EB5, which are not as commonly used. But as Christy mentioned before, there are EB1 priority workers who get to be at the front of the line. And then for EB2 and EB3, there are uh, categories that based on the degrees that someone holds and the job requirements for the role. So something to keep in mind here is that USCIS is actually the one who determines which chart you can use for each uh, month of the visa bulletin. And Christy, what does that mean? What, what does that mean that USCIS determines which chart to use when we were just talking about Department of State? Got it. Um, next slide, please, Eric. So thing to keep in mind is um, the reason why it's important is even though the Department of State is the agency that actually issues this chart monthly, the thing is the agency that actually adjudicates cases is the immigration service. The immigration service is an agency under the Department of Homeland Security and with the Department of Homeland Security, they're the ones that accept applications monthly. And so the, the challenge is when we talk about the visa bulletin, it is published by the Department of State. But ultimately, every month, what we do is we actually look at the immigration service. We go into the links on the immigration service, click onto that, and see which of the two charts they're sort of processing at any given period of time. I know it can be extremely challenging because if you log on or click onto the Department of Website, you'll see four charts, two charts that have final action dates, one for family-based cases, one for employment-based cases, and then you have um, final action dates or dates of filing and final action dates for both. So the challenge with the two is how do you know which charts to navigate? And so ultimately, because the last stage is filed with the Immigration Service, we refer back to USCIS to make that final decision in terms of which applications are eligible to be filed with them at that point in time. Next slide, please. Okay, so going back, I just wanted to go back to priority dates. So when we talk about the two charts that are available with um, the Department of State, ultimately, we care most about priority dates. 
And as I went through the sort of the trend in terms of the three stages of the green card process, the priority date for most folks is the date we file that PERM application. That priority is extremely important because that's the date that we use to determine where they're at, where someone is at in order to file for a green card application. For those first preference categories, the thing to keep in mind is they won't have a PERM application. So the date that we use instead for their priority dates is the filing of the I-140 petition. So the filing of the I-140 petition really will help us define where we go with individuals' green card applications. Next slide, please, Eric. Okay, the reason why it's so important is this. We take an individual's priority date. So if we file an individual's PERM application, we look to that date to decide, okay, this is their ticket in line for the next couple of stages to figure out what it's gonna take for them to get their green cards. The thing to keep in mind is we look at priority dates to look at eligibility for green cards, but we also take a look at priority dates for those that are going through the process to figure out how long and what it's gonna take for a green card to get adjudicated. So first step is this, right? Every month as immigration practitioners, we go on to the Department of State's website. Keep in mind the Department of State publishes it monthly, but it, we're not quite mid-month yet. So right now we're in the month of April. Um, the April bulletin is published, but what we'll, what we'll do is we'll take a look mid-April. So we'll get a sense of what May is going to be. Um, in the middle of April, the Department of State will publish dates for May. And so we'll take a look and have a sense of where they're gonna be at for the next month. But what we'll do is we'll take these charts, look at it, see what the dates are either for dates of filing or final action dates. And then once again, we take that one step further, as I mentioned, for looking at those who are filing applications, we'll actually go to the link to the USCIS website, click onto that, and that link will tell us which of the two charts that we're gonna be using to file for the adjustment of status. If someone's priority date is well before the date that's listed on the chart, that's fantastic news. Because what that means is that individual's green card application is current, which means that they're now eligible to file for the adjustment of status. So what's odd is the final action dates are meant for those to file, the, sorry, the dates of filing charts are for meant for those to file and the final action charts are meant for those for final adjudication. But USCIS kind of adds one more kink to it where they decide which charts to use for actual filing, which confuses it even more. But needless to say, if we use a particular chart, and generally they use the final action dates to accept cases. So when someone is current, we're then eligible to file for the adjustment of status. Good news is when someone's eligible to file for the adjustment of status, we're then allowed to file the supplemental EAD and advance parole. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those are the supplemental work authorization and travel documents that are tied to the green card application. So that's fantastic news for those that are filing. So why else do we care about priority dates? Uh, the other reason why we care so much about priority dates is, okay, you have a green card application filed. It's been pending. The thing to keep in mind is with the visa bulletin, dates are constantly fluctuating. Every few months you have dates progressing and moving forward. Other months dates are retrogressing and moving backwards. So in that instance, um, the reason why we also look at the monthly visa bulletin is you may have your adjustment of status application filed and pending. And you sort of want to get a sense of, well, now that my application's in queue, how long do I expect to wait to then get my green card out, to actually get my green card approved? And so what we do is we look at the final action dates at that point to gauge where the Immigration Service and the Department of State are at so that we have a sense of, okay, if my priority date is just a couple of days off from the final action date, that might mean that I'm pretty close to getting my green card. If my priority date is years away from the final action date, maybe it's two years away. Maybe you can assume at that point that it could take another two years to get the green card. So priority dates are pretty important because it's the ticket in line to gauge, yes, 
I am now eligible for that last stage of the green card process, which is the adjustment of status. And in addition to that, once you are able to file and you're sort of waiting around for the final adjudication, it's also a means of the waiting to see how long, how much further you're going to have to wait to actually get that green card approved. So that's the other reason why we look at priority dates. And one of the questions Marco and I get quite frequently is, you know, you know, we have clients who check the visa bulletin regularly. The first day it comes out, they're checking dates to see where they stand in queue. And in that instance, one of the things that we've been asked is, Christy Marco, our priority dates are current. As you can look at the dates, we're well before this. I've been following up with the immigration service. It's been months. Why haven't I gotten my green card yet? And the thing to keep in mind is when the visa bulletin is published, it's a snapshot at any given time. Charlie Oppenheim, the gentleman that Marco was talking about earlier, he's the one that sort of helps controls and predicts the dates. But when the dates are published, it's a date at any given time. And in that particular moment, it might appear that dates are current and available for these dates or visa numbers are available for these dates. However, in reality, if a visa number is used up or there's not sufficient numbers for a particular month, a lot of the adjudicators have to hold off on the filings to wait to see what happens before they're able to file cases. So that's why it's so important to look at priority dates because there's lots of fluctuations with the dates and it helps us kind of gauge where someone is at. With that, I'll move on to the next slide. Marco, did Great. you want to take a stab at navigating the bulletin? Yeah, so we've talked so much mechanics about the visa bulletin. It'd be great if we actually took a tour through the visa bulletin itself. So first step is to locate the actual chart that's needed in this process. Um, so here we're going to pretend that we're using the final action chart, which actually is true for April 2021. So as you can see here, we pulled up the actual dates. And in terms of the next slide. Okay, the next slide is um, step two. This is what I, I believe Mark was having a little bit of technical difficulties. So navigating the visa bulletin. Step two is um, looking down the columns. You can see the employment based categories. One, two, three, you've got other workers, fourth preference, certain religious workers. This is based on when we talked about the three stages of the green card application, the EB1 category is the first preference priority workers. There's a subset of folks who qualify for that. EB2 and EB3 workers are those that are tied to green card applications. You've got EB5, which are special subset. Um, all the other ones are uh, religious workers that we look at as well. But for the most part, the ones that we generally take a look at are the employment-based one, two, and three categories down the way to gauge um, what we look at. So we start with that in terms of listing and looking at an individual's preference category. Next slide, Eric. Okay, so that, as you can see, you got the one, two, three, as it refers to employment-based one, employment-based two, and employment-based three category. Let me go into EB1, EB2, and EB3 a little bit. EB1 stands for first preference priority categories, and there's sort of three subsets with that. EB1A stands for someone who's extraordinary in the field, and if someone has the credentials for that, they potentially qualify for EB1A. EB1B is someone who's an extraordinary researcher or professor based on the research work that they do. If potentially they qualify for that, that would also qualify for an EB1. Um, the third of the EB1 subsets is someone who qualifies potentially for EB1C, which is a multinational manager executive. So think of an intercompany transfer who's worked abroad. That person then transfers to the U.S. in a high-level executive or managerial role. In that instance, those individuals potentially could qualify for the EB1. When dealing with EB2 and EB3, this is kind of the bulk of most of what our corporate clients deal with. And a position that qualifies for EB2 generally is a job that requires an advanced degree or a job that requires a bachelor's followed by five years of progressively related experience, okay? And that usually is what EB2 is sort of defined as. Then when you look at the employment-based three categories, those are all um, 
professionals and it can be professional skills or professionals in nature and that's bachelors and everything else below a uh, bachelors in science so that qualifies the job as employment base three so in looking at the chart a you want to find out or you um if you're in hr you want to look at what is the classification of that role so that's what we look at first so whether a job is eb2 or eb3 that's one of the first steps and then next chart please um then the other thing is if you look across the way you can see we've got india circled you've got all chargeabilities you've got china el salvador guatemala honduras mexico philippines and vietnam what does this mean and so the thing to keep in mind is across all chargeability means everybody born everywhere else in the world the you've got china india mexico philippines and vietnam the reason why these countries in particular are listed is because as i mentioned earlier no one country can have more than seven percent immigrate immigration rates to the u.s because these countries tend to have higher immigration rates to the u.s they have their own special categories because it allows for um, Charlie Oppenheim and the Department of State to figure out how many visa numbers are being used at any given period of time. And so the other thing to keep in mind is when we look at priority dates, you've got countries across the way. Um, the question that we always get is, Christy, Marco, we were born in um, Liechtenstein, but I'm now an Indian citizen. What do I use? Do I use where I was born or do I use my country of citizenship? So even if you're now a national of another country, when we are navigating the visa bulletin, when we're navigating an individual's ability to file for that adjustment of status application, we're looking at country of birth. So if someone was born in India, they're gonna be subject to Indian numbers. If someone was born in Canada, in the UK, in France, we're gonna be looking at all chargeability areas listed. Um, it's self-explanatory, Vietnam, born in Vietnam, similarly, Mexico and the Philippines. Um, and so not only do we look at the preference categories, we need to figure out the, the country of birth for the individual and then use that handy dandy priority date that I looked at earlier and mentioned that ticket in line to get the green card. And that's gonna help us decipher next steps. Um, so moving on to the next chart, um, Eric. Okay, so if you look back at this chart, um, you see the priority date circled. Um, you see a bunch of C's, right? You see a bunch of C's across the chart and you see the date circled for September 1st, 2010. This is the April 2021 visa bulletin. This is the current visa bulletin. And anything with a C across the board means it's current. What that means is as of April, there are no backlogs for the employment based one categories for all chargeability. There's no backlogs for China for all chargeability for EB1 or India or Mexico. Anything with a C says that dates are readily available. If someone qualifies for that particular category, they're going to be eligible to file for that adjustment of status date. But if you look at this chart, and you look at China and India in particular, and you look at the dates, um, employment-based two categories, as I mentioned earlier, are the advanced degree positions. So China has a September 1st, 2016 date, whereas India has a May 1st, 2010 date. So if I were born in China and my green card application that my company sponsored for me qualifies for an advanced degree in that instance if i had a priority date to, of today so if my company filed my perm application today if i looked at this chart this is going to help me decide well how much further am i going to have to wait to then file for my adjustment of status so april 8th is today's date 2021 we're looking at China EB2. That looks to be two, five years. That seems like it's going to take quite a while. 
But instead, if I were not born in China, but I were born in India instead, if I were to look at that date, the priority date that's indicated on the chart right now is May, or the date that's indicated in the chart is May 1st, 2010. So if I had the same qualifications, being an advanced degree professional, but instead of being born in China, I was born in India, then in that instance, you can tell that my priority date um, would take a little bit longer than it would be if I were from China because with the 2010 date, we're looking at 11 years. If you see on the chart though, we have EB3 India circled and it had that September date. But if what you can note is why is it that EB3 seems to be moving faster than EB2? So this employment base three category seems to be more forward movement than it is in EB2. Similarly, if you look at the China charts for EB3, you'll note that you know EB3 China, if the job didn't require an advanced degree and just required a bachelor's degree and maybe a year or two of experience, that EB3 shows you a March 15th, 2018 date. That is two years above someone who qualifies for an advanced degree in China. So one of the things, one of the questions we oftentimes get is, Christy, I want to be EB2, or Christy, I want to be EB3. And the thing to keep in mind is we can't ever dictate whether or not you're EB2 or EB3. The classification of EB2 or EB3 is really done by the employer. Whatever the minimum qualifications of a particular job is, that sort of dictates whether or not a job is eligible for an EB2 or EB3 category. So when someone comes to us and says, I want to be EB2, hands down, that's what I want. The challenge is, yes, you may want to be necessarily EB2, but it really depends on the qualifications of the individual and the company's minimum qualifications. But according to this chart right now, it appears as if those who qualify for EB3 from India and China are going to be processed much quicker than those in the EB2 category. And that's why priorities dates part. Next chart. Okay. Um, oh, actually, go back one more to, to the chart again. Um, so the thing to keep in mind is every month this chart comes out and we look at the dates. And I think one of the things that we've seen trend-wise is it's so difficult to predict where you know the Department of State is going to be at any given time with visa processing. And so because of that, you know, we do our very best. We are very proactive. We do run monthly reports um, based on the visa bulletin to figure out who is or isn't eligible to file for their green card applications. But the reason why this date can be this chart can be so confusing is it changes. In some instances, the EB2 is faster. In other instances, EB3 moves forward. And so the challenge is the, the predictability. Um, in being in the immigration field for well over 20 years, you know, we've all heard about Charlie Oppenheim. He's the man. He's this man that sits, you know, probably in his office. And we as immigration practitioners for years have figured, you know, have tried to figure out where he's, where is he going to go with the, the visa bulletin? How is he going to make his predictions? And so one of the things I actually wanted to share was um, this last year has been really challenging for everyone. With COVID being what it is, um, with Trump's prior executive orders that sort of banned green card processing abroad, and you know not allowing for folks to file for immigrant visas abroad, what that did is it sort of delayed, or uh, there were tons of unused family-based visa numbers. So for fiscal year 2021. It was reported that because of the closures of the embassies and consulates because of COVID, not many people were filing for their family-based numbers. And as a result of that, we then saw all these unused family-based numbers, which were carried over to the employment-based numbers. And in looking at the allotment of employment-based numbers, it was stated that back for fiscal year 2021, 
we had well over 262,000 employment-based visa numbers being utilized for fiscal year 2021. And that's pretty much the highest that was allocated. Prior to that, I think the highest record prior to the 262,000 was 158. And don't forget that for employment-based numbers annually, you're looking at 140,000. So this past year, we almost had doubled the numbers that we've had in years past. And so that was what we saw for, you know, just a couple of months ago for fiscal year 2021. We're now in fiscal year 2022. It sounds weird because, you know, calendar year is still 2021, but we're in fiscal year 2022. Predictions are we'll have not only the 140,000 visas of employment-based numbers this year, one of the other things is because, you know, embassies and consulates are slow to reopening, people are taking their times in terms of moving forward with the family-based cases. Predictions are that the family, the, the, the numbers will, for employment-based numbers at least, will potentially get up to 275 this year. So that's really good news in terms of projections or possible projections. So why do we care about these dates and why am I mentioning these projections? The reason why I mention these projections is that might sort of help us navigate what do we expect to see in May, you know, next month? What do we expect to see in the next couple of months? If there's going to be an influx of additional numbers, then we either A, expect the visa bulletin to stay steady. If not, we potentially expect the dates to even be more forward moving. So um, Charlie Oppenheim did do a chat recently and there were a couple of takeaways that some of the stats and numbers that I was reading off just a second ago was a result of the chat with Charlie Oppenheim and he did indicate um, a little bit about what his expectations were for some of the, the numbers for the visa bulletin. Um, and I wanted to share some of those with you guys to kind of help better understand that. You know, with the C's across the board, that's that priority worker category. In years past, oftentimes India and China sometimes are backlogged a bit, and so you see dates being issued. But his expectations this year are for EB1 for China and India. We're definitely going to see forward movement, and he expects, I believe, that the EB1 numbers are going to stay put to the end of the fiscal year unless there's some um, increased demand, which he doesn't foresee as likely. Um, the interesting thing is in hearing him chat, he did talk about how he collectively takes that annual allotment, as Marco mentioned, he breaks out the annual quota, divides by four quarters, looks at usage at any period of time. He being the chief of the visa numbers, um, he is in constant contact with the immigration service and the embassies and consulates to help factor in numbers. And so he uses all of that to help sort of predict what numbers will be and then comes up with these dates. And the, the great news is because family numbers may not be used as much for employment-based numbers, we'll definitely see more progress with EB1 staying steady, as I mentioned earlier, EB2 and EB3 with forward movement. Hopefully that will see much faster forward movement with cases that we've had in the past. So that's that for navigating the bulletin. Um, can you fast forward please, Eric? So what are some advanced topics with um, the visa bulletin? We didn't want this, um, webinar to go away without kind of addressing some of the other things that we've seen um, when we deal with visa bulletin and processing dates. Um, next slide, please. A couple of concepts that we wanted to share um, in looking at dates and looking at eligibility. The one thing we know is for those who are from India and China, as you can look at the chart, you can see that there are backlogs. Some of these folks could be waiting five years, others might be waiting more than a decade. Um, and so one of the approaches that we take is we do take a very proactive approach. What can we do? How can we help our clients along to ensure that they you know, ultimately achieve their life goal of living here permanently in the US? One concept that we explore with clients oftentimes is this concept called cross-chargeability. And what cross-chargeability is, is if you were married 
and we have a client, a principal applicant, who is going through the green card process through their company. And in that instance, in looking at where they were born and looking at their preference category, EB2, their backlogged, in that instance, as I mentioned earlier in the charts, it's going to be a wait before they're eligible A to file their adjustment. And it's going to even take longer for them to get their green card adjudicated. But if our client is married and our client is married to someone who has, you know, who was born from a country that is not impacted, what we then can do is use the spouse's country of birth cross-charge it with our principal applicant's application, and then look at dates. And if the dates are current, the great news is we can then use the spouse's country of birth to then file the entire family's adjustment of status application. I know it's an earful, but that is one creative approach that we can certainly take and we have taken to help clients achieve their dream. So right now if you're on the call and it so happens that you're married and you and your spouse are married and were born in the same country no you're not going to get divorced to just benefit from a green card for those of you that are on the line who've never been married and you are engaged and if your spouse so happens to be born in a different country that you could potentially benefit from this is one avenue that potentially could put you in line to get a green card faster so that's one way of looking at the bulletin and country of birth of your spouse to help help move that process along. Second thing that we look at is priority date retention. What do I mean by priority date retention? We as immigration attorneys, whenever we look at a client's file, you know, we're doing our due diligence, gathering information, collecting information, both from the company and the foreign national perspective. Um, one of the questions we always do ask is, does an individual have an approved I-140 petition? And the reason why we ask that is we look to see whether or not there is a possibility of potentially retaining the priority date. As I mentioned earlier, that priority date is established at the PERM stage or for the EB-1 categories at the I-140 stage. If a person went through the green card process with their prior company, and was able to retain or was able to obtain an I-140 approval, that's fantastic news. And the reason being is we can potentially use the earlier priority date and apply it to the green card application that our corporate client is potentially going to be pursuing for their foreign national employees. What I mean by that is if we had a, a new client who had an I-140 approved from one of their prior employers, let's say something was approved back in, excuse me, 2015. So if we had a priority date of someone um, back in 2015, we potentially could move forward with a PERM application, an I-140 with our current client. And at the I-140 stage with our current client, we can go back and ask the immigration service, immigration service, our client has a prior priority date of 2015. Please now transfer that to our existing case. And fantastic news, that puts our client and your foreign national employee back in line to where they were at prior to um, their green card with their other existing companies. It's not necessarily that they're cutting in line. It puts them back in line to where they're at. So instead of filing a PERM application today with a priority date of April, 8th, 2021, that person's going to have a priority date of 2015, which in essence saves them a five-year wait um, waiting for that green card. So that can certainly save and cut down on time. And that's one other avenue that we explore. Two other concepts that we wanted to talk about and why we look at the visa bulletin, processing times, green card applications, is this concept of downgrading from EB2 to EB3. EB2, as I mentioned, is that advanced degree professional. EB3 is for the skilled workers. If we were looking at that last chart, if you notice the date for EB3 for both India and China removing much faster than they are for EB2. 
And one of the, in the last couple of years, we have definitely seen dates fluctuating where in some instances, AB3 China a couple of years ago, and most recently in the last few months, EB3 India seems to be moving faster based on looking at the dates um, than EB2. With the availability of visa numbers that opened up back in September and October of last year, as we were working through green card filings, we had numerous requests to what we call downgrade cases. And what that meant is people had pending, uh, pending green card applications based on an I-140 or they had an I-140 approval based on EB-2, but because the dates were so significant, we had tons of requests to then downgrade their existing I-140s to the EB-3 category with the hope of being able to move their green cards much faster in the EB-3 category. Thing to keep in mind is oftentimes Marco and I are asked, should I or should I not downgrade? And what I can tell you essentially is, that is an individual decision. There's pros and cons to both, and we would recommend that you talk to your immigration attorney to make that assessment. Um, historically speaking, EB2 has always been faster than EB3. However, most recently, we have noted that EB3 tends to be moving faster. Just because we have historical data and current data, it's difficult for us to predict ultimately should someone be EB2 or EB3 based on downgrading or not, but that is a discussion to be had. But for those that opt or choose to downgrade their existing cases, what that does allow is it allows for individuals to then be current where their priority dates are now valid so that they can file for that adjustment of status application. So end goal is to file the green card application, but you know there's discussions to be had in terms of whether it's worth it or not, and that's an individual decision from a company as well as an individual basis, but that's one other way of exploring priority dates and how that potentially can benefit an individual from um, advancing their green card application. And the last of all the advanced topics of why we care is, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at EB1 across the board, across all chargeability areas, across India and China, you know, and with potential expectations that EB1 potentially may stay current to the end of the fiscal year, what does that mean for you? So if you were newer in your career, this may not be necessarily your cup of tea. Um, as I mentioned, there's sort of three subsets to the EB1. And so generally you look at people who are a little bit more seasoned, who are advanced in their degrees, there are those different elements and requirements, and it varies depending on the classification. But in essence, for those who may have had more accomplishments to date, press publications, patents, awards, um, you name it, authorships, whatever it is, if there are things in your background that you feel might complement an EB-1 filing, we recommend you reach out to your immigration attorneys to do that assessment. Because what that can do is with an EB-1 case, maybe you're stuck in EB-2 and it's you're five years away from potentially benefiting from a green card through your existing company. But if you've had made some inroads and have tons of accomplishments, that's something else you might want to be able to explore because with the EB1A and B option, there is premium and you potentially can expedite that and get a decision. And if you do get an approval of this EB1 case, because you're current, you're automatically eligible to file the adjustment of status application. And then you could put yourself in queue for that last stage of the green card application and then have that filed right away. So that's a really great option to have. Not everyone's going to qualify. Um, with this current administration um, and the last, we've definitely seen higher scrutiny of EB-1 cases. So these aren't always slam dunk cases, but it's another possible avenue of moving cases along and being able to benefit quicker from applying for a green card and looking at the visa bulletin. I think next slide, please. And I think that leaves Great. us with questions <laughs> yes thank you so much christy uh that was great thank you for um walking us through the visa bullets and how to read it and um apologies i guess marco was having some tech issues um so apologies for that 
Um, so yeah, we do have a couple questions, but I also do want to be mindful of uh, time, and so we can maybe answer a couple. Um, apologies for going. Let's see, let's take a look. Um, all right, so Christy, um, like we discussed beforehand, I'll ask, and then uh, we'll see if uh, how comfortable you uh, answering. Um, what if you move to a different job with I-140 and your previous employer withdraws petition? Can you still retain priority date? That's a really good, that's a really good question. I think it depends. So it's a matter of I think we have to really explore the f facts of the case. Was the I-140 withdrawn? Was it still pending? The thing to keep in mind is those are the various variables for us to sort of determine whether or not an individual can truly keep their priority date. So um, if it's not yet approved, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to keep the priority date. If it has been approved, um, and even if it was drawn, ideally, you know, after six months, I think it's a much stronger case there. So it will depend on the situation. So I don't want to I don't want to make a blanket statement across the board. Potentially, you might be able to keep it. Potentially, you might not. It depends on the facts of the situation. Got it. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, a provision of the recently introduced legislation of U.S. Citizenship, Citizenship Act calls for removing country-based limits, as I understand. How will this change what the visa bulletin looks like for uh, EB cases? So the thing is, so I'm going to start by saying that with the proposals that are in Congress right now, keep in mind their their proposals, their bills that are being introduced. I know we have sort of an uphill battle in terms of getting you know change because keep in mind both houses of Congress have to agree to the terms. What's introduced may not be the final format, and ultimately what's signed by the president may look very different. So the challenge that the reason why I state that is it's difficult for us to exactly predict what things are going to look like, especially if the terms of what the proposals are could change. But generally speaking, the way the visa bulletin is calculated is based on, quote, it's a quota system right now. You've got employment-based numbers, you've got family-based numbers, you've got the various category numbers, as well as the per country limitations. So in that instance, if you were to get rid of per country limitations, some countries may benefit because there aren't, you know, there aren't quotas for those particular countries. Others may be harmed because there wasn't necessarily a strong demand. And now because it's a free for all, some companies might be negatively impacted while others may be positively impacted. But in terms of um, what it looks like, the actual terms and how it applies, I can't really speak to that because there's nothing definitive for us to really highlight. But it's it's definitely something for us to all watch because if there are massive changes, we can better talk through it. I think as those of you on the phone, I know it's extremely um, frustrating, you know, waiting a year, five years, 10 years, 12 years. We have clients that we work with today and. I work with clients that are, are very much at the end of the green card process, and it looks like it's going to be months, but it could be another couple of years. So the frustrations that I know my clients feel, um, I definitely feel for them because, you know, you want to kind of finish this process. But if there is immigration reform in changing the way visa bulletins are calculated, um, helping to get rid of country limitations, you know, there there's also, you know, recommendations of not counting spouses and children. So when we talk about the visa numbers being what they are of, for employment-based numbers, you're looking at 140,000 visas a lot of each year. And if you have a family of four, that takes away four visa numbers. But if you remove spouses and children from that, that's three less that would count against the 140,000 visas. So that could be another way to help advance numbers as well. So these are things that we're looking at, um, but nothing definitive yet. Great, thank, great answer. Thank you so much. Um, I think this will probably be our final question, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, so the the question and comment is uh, is in interesting that India is in its own category, but Pakistan is not. Um, I, I ask Christy, what determines countries uh, in their own category and whatnot? And the reason being is. Um, you know, some countries have higher immigration rates to the U.S. than others. 
And so for those countries that are have their own listed categories, it's because they're impacted countries. What that means is there are lots of folks from India, China, Philippines, and Mexico who want to come to the U.S. And so having its own category allows for um, Charlie Oppenheim to help maneuver and figure out visa numbers for those respective categories, respective regions and countries because they tend to have higher immigration rates. It's not that the laws are discriminatory, it's because there's high immigration rates um, for countries that are impacted. What it really comes down to is if there's a high demand, you may have to wait longer to get your green card because they have to go through all the other numbers before they get to your priority date. And so once they get to your priority date, then you're eligible. Pakistan doesn't have as high immigration rates to the US as India, and therefore it doesn't have its standalone um, dates to look after. Got it, thank you. Uh, great, well with that, Christy, uh, thank you so much. And Marco, thank you so much for the presentation today and uh, walking us through the visa bulletin. To our attendees, thank you for joining us this afternoon. As a final reminder, this brought a recording and the slide deck and Sherman HRCI continuing education credits will be emailed out tomorrow afternoon. So please keep an eye out on that message. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Have a good rest of your day and enjoy the upcoming weekend. Thank you so much.